Good evening, brethren. It's good to see everybody on such a very, very wet, wet Sunday. We're so thankful that you can be here, and if you'd like to be turning your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3, we will try to get through the first nine verses tonight, Lord willing. The title of the lesson, of course, is talking about scoffers and folks who will be scoffing at the Lord's return. If you'd like, let's read those verses together. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both, both letters, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of the uh, word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. To us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The early church, as we, th as we studied, uh, it's been a few months now, maybe a year or so ago. In Thessalonica, for instance, uh, the, you know, the thrust of that whole, both epistles was the second coming of the Lord. And it was not uncommon for Christians in the first century to greet one another with the phrase, he's coming. A constant reminder of the fact that Jesus is coming again. And I think that because of the length of time that has elapsed from when our Lord walked the face of the earth to now, that some people have, have got the idea that, you know, it's going to be way on out in the future and that it's still days and days ahead. But we don't know, and that's the whole point of being watchful, of making sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. Because we don't know when he is coming back, neither do the angels in heaven. You know, when we gather around this table and eat the Lord's Supper together, we're proclaiming that we believe that he is coming again. One of the attributes, one of the things we look at in the 1 Corinthian letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we look behind, we look back, we remember, we look forward to his return, and at the same time we look inwardly. That's a great lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
From the very beginning, men have scoffed at the Lord's return. We should not be surprised that people are doing it today. Some scoffed that he had come in the first century. Some people tried to deny the fact that he even walked the earth. Some people today, even with the mountains of evidence, and it is there in secular writings and just the influence that he's had, particularly the first, second, and third century that has carried over in, even into our day, some people would still try, try to deny that Jesus Christ was an historical figure, which is absolutely uh, incredible that someone would look at the evidences there, Trajan, other Roman historians who had absolutely no dog in the hunt, who would not have tried to prove or disprove, but simply mention in the historic annals that there was a fellow that name of Christ. And, uh, you know, it caused some trouble, they would say, uh, in the first century, particularly in the Roman provinces of, uh, of Judah <clears throat> and that area. But some people today will even try to deny that the Lord exists or has ever existed. As we looked at Bertrand Russell this morning, and you've got atheists and skeptics even today who will just really try to make fun and poke uh, holes and do everything they can to antagonize Christians. But his coming back is one of the great promises of the Lord. One of my favorite passages in all the Bible is in John 14 because this is a very intimate conversation. It's the last, uh, you know, it's the most lengthiest we have as well when Jesus has got his 12. The men that have been with him for almost three and a half years, he spent nights with them, he spent days with them, they have labored, they have went around, they've suffered persecutions, they've watched people try to kill him, they've watched him as he's done all these great miracles they themselves have done great miracles and now he has to try to get through their heads as a young man they can see the lord lord is not that old but that he is going to die and that is going to be their responsibility to go on and their responsibility don't worry about your responsibility it's going to be given to you to what to say what to speak but have confidence and believe and that i'm going to die and be resurrected the third day and he begins that that conversation to get their attention you know let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And he, they've been with him three and a half years. They preached. They've went out. They've performed miracles. And it's interesting that he's got to really try to bring this home because what's fixing to happen to them is, is <laughs> it's going to be awful. They're going to have their leader taken from them. Uh, they're going to be scared. They're going to give up on, on the, the movement, if you will. They're going to give up on the Christ. They're going to deny him. It's going to be terrible what's going to transpire in the next few weeks next few days, the next few weeks, but what's going to become of that? You're going to have some of the strongest and, of course, uh, stalwart soldiers of the cross that ever have been come from this group. And he tells them, don't you be troubled. And <laughs> how hard that would have been, especially with what he has to say. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be killed, but I am going to be resurrected. And they just, that, just phew, that would just go right over their heads. They didn't get that. They, what, what, you know. Even as many times he tried to tell them, I am going to be resurrected from the dead, it would take them seeing him resurrected from the dead to really drive it home and go, hey, you know when he said he's going to be, <laughs> he meant exactly what he said. He's really come back from the dead. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus Christ right now preparing a place for us, for his disciples. What a great promise. And if I go and we watch Jesus does that very thing, and his disciples watch him go. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Boy, if you can't find comfort in that passage, knowing that when our friends and loved ones who die in the Lord, they're immediately escorted by the angels into the very bosom of Abraham and to fellowship with Christians who've gone on before, that we too, upon the sensation of our hearts beating, upon leaving this tabernacle, we too will be together forever if that doesn't motivate you and move you to, to just sincere just, uh, appreciation and confidence in what the Lord has said, I don't know what could. This is uh, my favorite text as far as funeral goes. I, I try not to use it too much. I don't want to overuse it. But I hope that the man one day who preaches my funeral will use this uh, passage to try to comfort my family uh, because I think it's a source of great comfort. I'll see you again. Uh, when I was talking to Brother Swafford, didn't know if he could hear me the last few hours of his life, didn't realize it was going to be the last few hours of his life, but I have absolute confidence that I will see that man again. The brothers, Brother Warren and, and folks that we've lost here, absolute confidence. The Lord has gone to a place to prepare a place for them. He's preparing a place for me, and one day we will be together forever. That's the great hope. That is the great confidence. And we can't allow people who just, ah, what's that? 
to take that away from us. It's easy to scoff at anything, you know. Uh, one of the things being a Tennessee fan, you know, here lately, uh, you can scoff at Alabama all you want to, but I tell you what, they're on a roll right now. And so, you know, but it's hard to, to scoff at something that's an actual, something really happening, as much as we may want to. But here is something serious. I mean, we're talking about life and death and people that want to scoff at the Christ and, and scoff at people's great hope based upon evidence, not just some fairy tale, not just some Santa Claus in the skies, Bertrand Russell and Anthony Flew and all those uh, atheists and skeptics would like for us to believe, but based upon truth, based upon reality, based upon things that have already come to pass, as Peter is going to spend quite a bit of time with in, in, this, in this first nine verses. Not only that, but a promise made by the angels at his ascension. His disciples, you remember, standing there, it says, when he had spoken these things, Jesus, while they beheld, he was taken up. That had to be something to, to, to watch. And the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said also, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. I remember when I was a small, smaller fellow, younger fellow, probably 10, 11 years old, we lived down in New, a place called New Smyrna Beach. And if you know anything about Florida, you know that it's just flat. And uh, when Cape Canaveral, which wasn't that far away, pretty good ways if you wanted to walk it or drive it, but as the crow flies, it wasn't that far away. And if you could get up on top of your house, which we did, you could watch the space shots, you know, when they would send up uh, uh, spaceships uh, up to the moon and things of that nature. And it was real common. Folks would come over, and we'd get up on top of the house, and, boy, you'd see that thing take off, and you'd see it fly. And I remember as a kid, you know, just watching that thing. Long after the, all the adults had gathered their stuff and gone down, I, I wouldn't. I'd just kind of hang out there because you could see it. Just go on and on and on, and finally you'd lose it. You couldn't tell the difference between it and an airplane that might have been going by or something. But you could watch it for the longest time. And I remember I would do that. And I can understand why the apostles would like, that's not something you see every day. A fella <clears throat> ascending into heaven, floating up. I mean, they didn't even have airplanes. Imagine that. <clears throat> they are watching the Lord ascend up. I can certainly understand why they're standing there still watching. Is he going to fall back down? Because, I mean, what goes up, what? Come back down. You can it. But the angels tell him this is exactly how he is going to return. So we have the Lord himself promising, we have the angels promising, and all the apostles. It's a promise not lost on, on the disciples. Notice how Paul would finish out the first Corinthian book. O oh Lord, come. They expected him to come. Their great hope was in his return. Our great hope is in his return. John would pen the last words of the New Testament. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Two of the closest people to Jesus. Of course, Paul never spent time with him intimately like John did. But, of course, everything he wrote, the times that he spent, you know, he was a great soldier of the cross. Both men looking to that return for that great hope that the Lord had promised. No doubt, I believe some people take great pleasure in scoffing at the Lord's return. And they like to do it at mine and your expense. You really believe that? You believe a fellow that's been dead 2,000 years is going to come back and he's going to bring angels and there's going to be this great day of reckoning? And they scoff at that. You know, there's even been believers who have doubted, who have uh, Psalms 90, for instance. We, not Psalms, yes, Psalms 90, where you have a, a man that's saying, look, I see all the evil in the world and it seems like the bad guys are always coming out on top. I look at that and I'm going like, you know, there's no justice. And then he says, I remember, you know, I remember. That's why preachers and teachers and elders, it's, it's our job to remind people of the great promises and that there will one day will be a day of reckoning. And someday he will get his or she will get his. There will be a balancing, if you will. The Lord will take vengeance. He'll give the rewards that are due. <clears throat> there are those who are devoted to false religions. There are those who would like to tell you the return's already taking place. I'm not joking you. There are people in the Lord's church who believe that the resurrection has already taken place, that the second coming has already taken place, and now we're, we're living in a post-second coming time. You might say, well, how in the world do they figure that? Trust me, it is way, way out there. It's called realized eschatology, and there are even brethren who try and, and, and believe that, which is ridiculous because the Lord said he had deserved the Lord's Supper with us where? In the kingdom. You know, and he observes it with us all the time. These folks that believe that, 
are still observing the Lord's Supper, which is, you can't harmonize the two. Well, what are we to do as Christians? Four things. Number one, remember scoffers are to be expected. They're supposed to come. The Lord's told us, hey, they're coming. So when we see them, don't be surprised. Number two, remember God's word's consistent. It doesn't change. It doesn't change with the archaeologist's shovel. It doesn't change because some scientist says he found a, a drop of water on Mars. It doesn't change. God's word's consistent, and it is truth. Number three, God's not in time. That's, a, that's something that's hard for me to grasp. I like spending time with it. I like turning that over in my mind. But I don't spend a whole lot of time with it because it's not something that you can, uh, well, it's just not something I can get my rope around, if you will. God is not in time. And number four, remember that God is not, <clears throat> God is long-suffering, not slack. First of all, when people scoff, remember, they're to be expected. The value of being reminded. This is brought out again and again in Peter's books. We have to remind people because there's going to be people that are going to say, well, what about this? And what about that? And, of course, Peter's going to anticipate, I think, the, the single greatest argument <clears throat> For the scoffer who would look at you and I and try to say, why do you believe that? I mean, tomorrow, you know, the east, uh, the sun's going to come up. It's going to sit down in the west. It's been going on that since the day. You know, there's people that try to tell you matter is eternal. Uh, Bertrand Russell, for instance, he was one of those fellows that believed matter is eternal. How do, you, uh, you know, how do you take the laws of thermodynamics and harmonize those two? Known scientific principles that energy is wearing down. It's not being recreated. It's wearing down, and it can't be eternal or it would have <coughs> already wore out. But anyway, the value of being reminded, we think about the prophets of old, we think about the prophets today. First of all, the prophets of old. Think about Noah. Do you think he was scoffed at? Here's a fellow building a boat out in the middle of his yard, if you will. There's no water. I mean, you can imagine the people making fun of him, saying, how are you even going to get that down to the river? You know, and, and he, they don't know, as far as we know, we don't know that it ever had even rained at that point. It seems the Bible indicates that the earth was watered from underneath. And so, Noah, you're building this boat, and you're going to put all these animals on. Don't you know the ridicule that that man went through? Think of Moses, his leadership. Even when God's presence, God had been speaking to Moses face to face, if you will, they'd seen the Red Sea open up. They'd been through the ten flags of Egypt. And here you got a fellow saying, you know what? We don't think you ought to be the leader. We want to be a leader too. And, of course, the 250 people that followed Korah and his bunch, all the earth swallowed them up. They, they were scoffers in those days. Isaiah. His prophecies against Egypt, uh, people, he was just made fun of. He was just made fun of. Elijah it was called the troubler of Israel by the very troubler of Israel. Jeremiah, remember a fellow took his yoke off. The Lord had told him to wear this yoke and to walk around town, if you will, and tell people, hey, 70 years, we're going to be in this yoke. Do you remember the fellow that came up, took the yoke off, broke it, and said in two years the Yoke's going to be broken just like this. Jeremiah says, well, you know, that might be the case. We'll see it in the end. But I can tell you one thing, you're not going to live to see it. And within that year, that prophet or false prophet died. Think about Ezekiel. First of all, he tried to, you know, he had to convince the people that Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. They didn't believe that. When it was, his mission changed midstream, if you will. Now he had to impress upon Israel the fact that they were going to go back in a few years. They didn't want to believe that. Constantly being ridiculed, and Amos, remember when Amos was preaching in Israel, you know he probably didn't want to be there. He was from the southern kingdom. He's in Israel teaching the northern kingdom. Listen, you guys are all, got it all wrong. God has a plumb line. Remember all those old uh, stories of Amos, the summer fruit, and so forth? You need to repent. And you remember he was told by the prophets up in that area, the preachers up in that area, hey, why don't you go back to Jerusalem and preach? Go down there and get your bread to eat. Of course, they were just thinking that he was prophesying for money, and they were saying, why don't you go back to Jerusalem? You preach down there to the southern kingdom. You remember Amos' response. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet. But God called me. I was a herdsman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. But God told me. God put these words in my mouth, and that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. All these men were laughed at and ridiculed. Think about Jesus in Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Brethren, there's, there's a warning there, a huge warning of scoffers. Acts 20, Paul warning the Eph elders at Ephesus. 1 Corinthians 15, warning against those who are going to teach against the resurrection, saying that it is already passed. Amazing, we have brethren teaching that today, isn't it? And the entire 15th chapter, just about, of 1 Corinthians is dedicated to the fact that folks were trying to teach that in the first century. It was wrong then, and it's wrong today. 1 Timothy 4, the Spirit, spirit speaking expressly in the latter times shall... Uh, you know, to be seducers and people speaking things they shouldn't. Second Timothy 4, same thing. 
preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Why? People want their ears tickled. They want to hear things that, that are not true. The book of John, <clears throat> the burst of, and the book of First and Second John, all written to combat scoffers and people that would say, well, Jesus ain't even the Christ. He's not even God in the flesh. And John would donate and spend all that material trying to prove that indeed he was, and then the very letters that we have from Peter. So there's a lot to be said about being reminded, and that's been the prophets of old and the prophets of new. And by new, I mean the New Testament. Warning people, warning brethren, warning this nation of Israel who were God's people. Listen, keep your watch, be watchful, follow after God, seek ye the old paths. And yet Ezra said, we will not walk in his way, we're going to do what we want to do. And brethren, the situation has not changed. You have preachers who are trying to convince brethren, listen, look, we have got the principles to guide the church. We don't need to deviate from these. We don't need to walk off and go off into other paths. Seek the old paths, but you have brethren that don't love it so. They want to be like the world. They want to hear smooth things. They want to be prophesied deceits. There's nothing that's changed. And Peter's saying, wake up. Realize there's going to be people in your day that are going to be scoffers. They're going to come in the last days, and they're going to say all these things. They're going to try to lead. And why are they going to do that? Well, he's going to give us the motivation here. Notice in verse 3, if you have your Bibles open, if you don't, <clears throat> I'll uh, read them. And you know, it'd do me a whole lot better if I was in uh, 2 Peter 3 instead of Philippians 3. In 2 Peter 3, verse 3, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, scoffers. So when are they going to come? The last days. What are we in? The last days. So we shouldn't be surprised. What will be their motivation? Notice the last part. Walking after their own lust. What motivates them? To win souls for Jesus? To win soldiers for the Christ? To save their families? To save themselves? No, their own lusts. And we spent a lot of time reading about the motivations that, of these men, <clears throat> women, in Second Peter chapter 2. They're motivated for what they can get out of what they're doing. Notice number three. What kind of arguments that they will use? And it's a pretty good argument. Hey, man, I've been, I'm 49 years old almost. Every day I've been here, sun's come up over there, it goes down over there. It may tilt a little bit, <laughs> you know, when the earth goes through its different rotations and fall and spring, and it may look like it's a little further down or a little further, a little higher, but uh, that's how it works. Been that way since the beginning of time, they'll tell you, and they'll scoff, and that sounds like a pretty good one. Remember, God's word, though, is consistent. God's word's consistent. Scoffers forget about the flood. That's Peter's point. They forget about the fact that the world's already been through this once. And brethren, I tell you what, there's a, there's a lot of evidence out there, and I wish I was better on this, and maybe one day I'll try to do uh, some lessons on this because it's something I would need to spend some time with. So I'd kind of have to put the parking brake on and, and camp out and spend some time there. But there's a lot of evidence that there, the society that we read about in Genesis chapter 6 was a lot more developed than we give it credit for. And there were probably a lot more people than we think. We think because we're in Genesis 1 and everything's just kicking off, at the time we get to Genesis 6, well, it's only five chapters. I mean, how much could they have had going on? But there's supposed to have been a lot of years that, that transpired there. The genealogy that you can see there, there were many generations. And it's been, uh, as a matter of fact, Brother Holman's son sent me a link to a website, an article, talking about there could have been, you know, this fellow argues there could have been a billion. I remember the first time that I heard there could have been a million. I thought, that's kind of out there. Now, a billion? Well, one thing's for sure, it's a whole lot more people than I thought. I remember the first time I read that account, you know, you kind of, first impressions, I was thinking there might have been 10, 12,000 folks or something, you know. I mean, it's only five chapters, but what we realize is the day with the Lord is what? As a thousand years, we're going to read by here. So there could have been a couple, of, you know, a thousand years, 1,500 years, something that transpires there. We don't know for sure, but a, a lot more time than generally uh, we like to give it, and uh, we'll see that uh, there were probably a lot more people. And the cataclysmic flood, what took place was not just a lot of water. You know, there was the, the floods of the earth, if you will, the, uh, the things that took place, maybe volcanic activity and things of that nature, or total reshaping of the face of the earth. A, a lot more than, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if any of you got a chance to watch the Bible. I have it recorded. I plan on watching it past the first 30 minutes at some point. But I have watched the first 30 minutes, and I, I thought they used a lot of computer-generated uh, graphics and things, and I thought their depiction of, of Noah's Ark was probably one of the best that I've ever seen. Because a lot of times we think it rose, you know, it started raining, the ark just kind of lifted up, you know, no big deal. 
Well, in this thing, you see it being tossed to and fro. And that, I mean, the, all the things that were taking place. Imagine the worst thunderstorm and rains that you've ever seen. Imagine volcanic activity and the, the earth's plates shifting and, and continents moving, if you will. And all that went on uh, during that, you can imagine what a, a terrible event that was. And uh, Peter says, scoffers forget about that. They forget about that. The flood is evidence of the certainty of God's word. Notice in Matthew 24, 37, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ says, but as the days of Noah, and that's just the difference in the spelling from the Greek, uh, from the Hebrew to the Greek. That's Noah. That's Genesis chapter 6. Jesus says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What's his point? People are going to be going about their daily lives. They're going to be having parties. They're going to be having dinner parties. They're going to be having marriage feasts. They're going to be given and taken in marriage. It's going to be a day like any other day. And Jesus says this is going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. You know, Genesis chapter 1 through 11 is probably the most attacked part of the Bible. But do you know Jesus spends more time there than just about any other place, say the book of Psalms, talking about, uh, you know, the things that took place then, even when it comes to marriage and divorce and even remarriage. Jesus will take everybody back to where? Genesis chapter 2, the way it was in the beginning. And that's what he does here in Matthew 24. People are going to scoff and say, this is not going to happen. And he says, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Everybody's going to be going about their own business when this great uh, happening takes place of Matthew 24. The flood is evidence of the certainty of God's word. But notice also, scoffers want to say, well, you know, it's been a long time. Well, yeah, it's been a long time. One thing we need to remember and it's tough for me, and I, I've spent a lot of time with this, probably a lot more than a fellow ought to, but I've spent time with it. <clears throat> Unlike man, God is not a slave of time. That is just, I'd just say, just about impossible for me and you to understand. I mean, can you, can you draw eternity for me? Tell me about eternity. I heard a guy one time, I guess, you know, it could probably help me about as much as anybody could. It says an ant took off. An ant took off walking. And that ant walks, and he keeps walking. And he keeps walking until he wears a trail out on the earth. And that rut gets deeper and deeper, and he keeps walking, and he keeps walking until he's walked so much that he actually cuts the earth in half. And so there's the beginning of eternity. Because you know as long as I do how long it would take for that to take place. Eternity. You can't get your mind on it. You can't get your mind around it. At least I, I haven't found a good way. <clears throat> Psalms 90 at verse 4. Which, by the way, is what Peter's quoting. It says, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. People have taken that passage, and they have absolutely run with it. And they've said, well, you know, a day with the Lord is the same as a thousand years. They've equated that. That's, that's not how we use language. It's just a description. In other words, time doesn't mean anything to God. It's not a big deal for God. He's not locked in time. He's not getting older. His hair is not falling out, nor is it turning gray. Uh, he's doing fine, and he's going to do fine. The Lord's not worried about time. And when we can grasp the fact that, you know, our whole world, this is it, you know, uh, for, for a lot of us, you know, the southeastern United States may be as far as we ever get in this world. But our world, this is what we're locked into. It's what we know. And when we think about the fact that God was in the beginning, and not only was he at the beginning, but that he also knows the end from the beginning. The church was in the mind of God before he even created the earth, the church that our Lord would die for, that you and I are members of. God knew about it. He knew that Judas was going to betray our Lord, and somehow that took place. God knew it, but didn't affect Judas's free will. How do you do that? I do not know. I know that God, Jesus Christ himself, says, Listen, you two wicked cities. If what had been done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, what would have happened? He not only knows what did happen, he knows the possibility of what could have happened if the circumstances had been different. You think about that. Not only does God know what you're going to do, but he knows what you would have done had the circumstances been different and something else been brought in. In other words, the possibilities. And I don't even want to talk about that anymore because that just blows my mind that God not only knows what's going to happen, 
but he knows what might have happened had the situation been a little bit differently and you've been influenced by something or not influenced by something. That's amazing to me. But I look at that and I see now how God can say, listen, you're not going to be tempted above that you're able. Why? God says he's faithful and he's not going to allow it to take place and he knows what your breaking point is. And he's not going to allow you to get pushed past that. But Jesus will say, Tyre and Sidon, if what had been done in you had it taken place in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Not only does he know the end from the beginning, but he knows the various possibilities of different scenarios that might have taken place. That, that's over me, brethren. That's over me. God knows the end from the beginning, but he also <clears throat> knows the beginning from the end. You see, God is not in time. He is out of time. And that's why he could say, that Jesus Christ was going to be born in Bethlehem Ephrata. Not only at the town, but the specific location of that town, because there was more than one Bethlehem. He could give us the, 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 what I want to do, and I kind of hate pinning myself down here, but I might as well. I want to start a study of the book of Daniel as soon as we finish uh, <clears throat> Second Peter. And one of the reasons is, is the prophecies that Daniel gives at the end. I mean, we're nailing it down to the year, hundreds of years in advance, where... God is saying, listen, this is what's going to take place. And he tells Israel, he tells Daniel about the kingdoms that will come up. Alexander the Great and his daddy and the four generals that will take and divide Alexander the Great's kingdom. And not only those four generals, but which will rise in power and rule in Jerusalem. And the fact that one day that Rome would rise into power. Uh, absolutely amazing stuff. How can God do that? He's not in time. And when you start thinking about time, look at it the way the scoffers look about it, you know. Say, okay, a day is a thousand years, although remember, that's just a figure of speech. It's like saying I'd give my right arm for them noodles over there. Well, you're not going to do that, you know, not for a bowl of noodles. But notice, like two days <laughs> since the Lord left the earth. You want to look at it like people want to say, okay, two days ago he left the earth. And think about it. When he gave Abraham the promise, it hadn't even been a week yet. But God, we know, is not locked in time, and it doesn't feel like a week to the Lord. He is not in this thing that we call time, even though it means so much to us. And we can see from day to day as, as things change in our bodies. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. We know that we're locked in this time, and we know that we change with time, but God doesn't. God doesn't change with time. He doesn't grow old. He doesn't forget things. He is God. He is outside of time, but he's placed me and you in time. And it's in this time where we test ourselves, where we prove ourselves, whether we love him or not. We'll find ourselves at different positions in this time. God's not in time. Remember, God is, not, not, is, is long-suffering, not slack. A lot of people look at God's long-suffering. They say, well, you know, he's just letting things go, you know. He's not really holding anybody accountable. The writer of Ecclesiastes would warn governments, would warn people about that. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 at verse 11, the, the emphasis is because sentence against an evil work, in other words, somebody does something bad, the punishment for it, because evil against a, a sentence against an evil work is not carried out quickly, is the idea. The heart of men is set to do wickedness. In other words, if you let people commit crime and commit crime and commit crime, guess what people are going to do? They're going to commit crime. But if a fellow commits a crime, you find him guilty, you walk him out into the courtyard or whatever and you hang him or you execute him, guess what that's not only going to do to him, that's going to end his life, that the justice is going to be served, but what's that going to do to the community? Why do you think people put a gun in people's face nowadays and don't hesitate to pull the trigger? I mean, how many times do you watch the shows or read in the paper where somebody's being charged with murder and they've already been convicted of a murder before? Such ought not to happen because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. The hearts of men are set to do mischief. I mean, that's just the way it is, and we need to realize and learn from that. God is long-suffering, not slack. Some might think the Lord is slack concerning his promises. He's not willing that any should perish. That's what we need to remember. He's given us time. He's given you and I time to preach to people. He's given other folks time to hear and to repent, but time will run out. Malachi 3 at verse 6. This ought to stick in your craw, brother. This ought to see something you remember. When we think about the long suffering of God, Malachi chapter 3 is written about 400 years 
before the Christ. Remember that timeline I gave you before? Uh, Moses, excuse me, Abraham's out there at about 2000 B.C. And I know these are, these are very round figures, okay? About 1500 B.C., you'll have Moses. And then about 500 years later, you have David. And then the ending of the, New Te- the, ending of the Old Testament, about 400 years before the Christ. So we have Moses writing the, the Old Testament. The seed promise is being given in uh, Genesis chapter 12, uh, 13, and so forth. Malachi 3 is, is, is being penned about 1,600 years. 1,600 years. There weren't even people speaking English 1,600 years ago. You know, now we're thinking 1,600 years have elapsed since God gave the promise and Malachi is penning this. And God says, Israel, children of Jacob, children of the promise, if you will, he says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, sons of Israel, tribes of Israel. Remember, Jacob is the great-great-grandson of Abraham. The promise was given about 2,000 years before the Christ. Moses wrote about it about 1,500 years. Malachi picks up on it 400 years before the Christ. A period of at least 1,100 years have transpired since Moses' writing and Malachi's writing. And God says, the only reason, Jacob, that you're alive and and, and, and today is the fact that I've got a promise to keep. I am the Lord God, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. We're just talking about 1,100 years that God basically hand-carried a group of people into a position to deliver the Messiah so that we could have that blessed seed promise that uh, we would have today through, through Jesus Christ. 1,100 years riding this. It's only been 2,000 years, roughly, since the Christ walked this earth and died for our sins. As we looked at earlier, if you want to count time as some folks, that's only been a couple of days. Brethren, that's not much time when it comes to God. Not much time at all. Remember, it's no time, really. He's not locked in time. When people scoff, and you're going to hear people make fun of your religion, make fun of God, remember, they're to be expected. Number two, God's word's consistent. It has not changed. God's not concerned with time. He's not locked into it. And God is not slack, but God is long-suffering. Peter wrote this to remind us of the day of the Lord. We're going to spend a lot more time with that in the weeks to come as we look at the promise of the fact the earth is going to be destroyed. The promise of God that everything as you know it is going to be melted. It is going to be gone. Our Jehovah's Witnesses, friends, notwithstanding. We'll talk about this more in the next lesson, but brethren and friends, what about you? What about you? Are you ready for the day of the Lord? You think about that now. We'll, we'll talk more about this in the days to come. But everything that you own, everything that you have, if you were to live until the Lord's return, will be burned up, melted with fervent heat. Peter asked the question, what type of person ought you to be? You see, it's what within my character, who I am, that's important. Not what I have, not where I've been, not my family's name, not my face, if you will. That j- 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 God is not going to... Judge us according to our face, which has the, the idea of who you are or who you know or who you've run with or what your last name is or how big your bank account is. He's not concerned with your, your face. He's concerned with what you are inside. Are you ready for the Lord? If you've never obeyed the gospel, the terms of admittance, we talk about them all the time. Hear the word of the Lord. Be willing to can repent of your sins. Confess his name before men. Be baptized. The Lord will add you to the church. Then staying faithful, which is, of course, the, hard, the really hard part, the, the run, the, the, the marathon, not the sprint, but the marathon. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come as together we stand in sun.